So this is some worked examples of past papers for the variation and inheritance topic. So we've looked in previous lessons about um, genetics. We've looked at how genes are passed from parents to offspring and uh, the different alleles of genes are the different forms of genes. So do make sure you have an understanding of the summary notes for this topic before you have a look at these. So the purpose of this is just to show you some past papers on the topic and just how you would go about answering them. So let's have a look at the first one. So it's important that you read all of these questions really carefully. There's always key information at the start. So tongue rolling is an inherited characteristic in humans. It is determined by the dominant form of the gene, big T, and the non-rolling condition is determined by the recessive little t. The family tree diagram shows the path from inheritance in one family, and we've got a key to help us identify what traits each individual has. So we're first of all asked to state the genotypes of the following individuals, male one, female two, and female four. So having a look at uh, male one, who is this individual here, that's who we're being asked to find out first of all. Um, but what we're going to have to do is have a look at the parents. So remember that a non-roller is recessive. So if we have a non-roller like this parent here, the only possible genotype is little t, little t, because they cannot be a non-roller and have a rolling um, allele, because that's dominant. The female parent, we know that they are a roller, but remember there is more than one possibility here. She might be big t, big t, or she might be big T, little t. But there is only one correct answer. She has to be big T, little t, because the only way that that couple could have non-rolling children, like two and three, is if she passes on a little t to meet the little t from the dad's sperm. Okay, so we need these two to come together to produce little t, little t's. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so let's have a look. Male one, we need to know what their genotype is. So we know that they are a male roller. So we know that they have to have a big T to be a roller. Now the big T must have come from mum because the dad didn't have one to pass on. The dad has to have passed on a little t because that's all he can pass on. So male one has to be big t, little t. Let's have a look at female two. So female two is a non-roller. That one's actually really easy. If she's a non-roller and non-rolling is recessive, don't even really have to work it out from the parents. The only way she could be a non-roller is if she is little t, little t. Female four is a little bit like male one. We know that she is a roller, so she has to have inherited a big T from mum, but the dad has to have passed on a little T because that's all he has got available. And there we have it. So that is our first one. The next part of this asks us to identify which parent is homozygous. So let's go back. Homozygous, remember that means that they have two of the same allele, okay, because homo means same. So if we have a look at the two parents, the dad is little t, little t. So he is homozygous because they're both the same. The mum, the female, we know that she is heterozygous and we've explained why already. So the only parent here who is homozygous is the male parent. Give the term used for different forms of the same gene. So this is a knowledge question. And the answer to that one is allele. So that just comes straight from your summary notes. And then tongue rolling is an example of a discrete variation. Describe what is meant by the term discrete variation. So this is characteristics where the variation exists in small groups.
there is not a big range of variation. Remember, so when we're talking about discrete variation, it's small possible groups. So for example, in tongue rolling, it is yes, they can or no, they can't. Eye colour, it can be blue, green, hazel, brown, but there's not a big range. Continuous variation is where there is a lot of range. So that's things like height and weight. Okay, the next question. Coat colour in Labrador dogs is an inherited characteristic. The black coat Big B is dominant to the chocolate coat colour Little B. A homozygous black Labrador was crossed with a Labrador with a chocolate coloured coat. We have to complete the diagram to show the genotypes of each of the parents and the F1 phenotype. So let's first of all deal with the black coat. So we're told that the black Labrador is homozygous. So that makes things a little bit easier. So it's homozygous. We're also told that black coat colour is dominant. So Remember that genotypes are shown by letters. We use the capital letter for dominant and we use the lowercase letter for recessive. So if black, we know that it's a black homozygous and we know that the black is dominant, then we are going to have to use big B, big B for the black coat. The chocolate coat lab, well, if it's chocolate, then it has to be, if chocolate coat is recessive, then they have to have two copies of the recessive value. So that's little b, little b. The chocolate coat could not have a big B because that would have made them black. Okay, so a cross is then carried out between two parents and every single possibility gives us big B, little b. So they're all big B, little b. The next bit we need to fill in, though, is what is the F1 phenotype? So what do they physically show? Well, the fact that they have got a big B means that they have to show the dominant form, which is black. Okay, so they would be black coat. So we're asked to explain what is meant by polygenic inheritance. So this is a knowledge question. It's unrelated to the previous part. What is polygenic inheritance? This is characteristics which are controlled by more than one gene. Okay, and then we're asked to state the type of variation that's shown by polygenic inheritance. Well, when traits are controlled by more than one gene, we have a huge range of variation, much bigger than discrete. So the type of variation is called continuous variation. OK, so the answers to part B, they are just taken straight out of your summary notes. That is just knowledge. OK, another question. Hair type in humans is controlled by a single gene. The dominant form is curly. The recessive form, little h, produces straight hair. So curly is dominant, straight hair is recessive. Both parents of this curly haired child have the genotype big H, little h. And we're asked what term is used to describe the genotype of both parents. So both parents are big H, little h. That is two different alleles for this gene, two different forms of the gene. So the term that we use to describe that is heterozygous. Because remember, hetero means different. OK, so heterozygous genotypes for those parents. The next thing we're to do is complete the Punnett square to show the possible genotypes of their offspring. Now, the Punnett square has actually been set up for you, which makes life that little bit easier. All we have to do is fill in each of the squares for the offspring. So if we start with this square here, OK, to do this, what we're doing is the simplest thing I would suggest is just work your way down and then so kind of like this and then work your way along like this. So if we do that, then what we get is big H 
and big H, because I've just taken this, this H and I've put it down that column. If we go down this column now, we're going to be getting little H's. Then we go across the way, so I'm going to put a big H across each of these. And then we're going to do this one, I'm going to go work our way across and it's going to be like that, okay? So that is our completed square. Now, obviously, I've just put the arrows in just to kind of show you the process. Now, you would want to, to leave that out and you just want the completed squares. So that's the complete Punnett square. You have to state the possible genotypes of the girl in the picture. So we have to have a look at the girl in the picture, first of all, and we can see she kind of has curly hair. And curly, we were told, is the dominant form. So there are two possible genotypes for curly hair. She might be this one, big H, big H. Or she could be one of these, big H, little h. Because remember, the dominant form of the gene, you only need to have one dominant allele. And that's what you will show. So big H, big H, or big H, little h. Okay, next question. Um, similar idea. We've got hair appearance in mice is controlled by a single gene. Wavy hair, big H, is dominant to straight hair, little h. We've got two homozygous mice crossed. One has wavy hair and one has straight hair. And the first thing we're asked to do is put in their genotypes. Well, the key thing in this question is that they are both homozygous for whatever they are showing. So the wavy hair one is going to be big H, big H, okay? Because remember, it does say up here in the question that we have to use the letter H, wavy hair. And then the straight haired one, again, also homozygous, that one is going to be little h, little h. And we're asked to state the phenotype. We're asked to state the phenotype of the F1 mice. So we're going to have to do the cross. We've got our parent generation. We've got big H, big H. That's one parent. So we put them down the side. The other parent, I'm going to put along the top. And that was the little h, little h. It doesn't actually matter which way round you put the parents, but you have to make sure you've got um, one parent on one side and one parent at the top. OK? So let's have a look. If we do this cross, I'm going to start by going down the way, first of all. So there's my H's, my little H's from that parent. Then I'm going to work my way across from side to side. And here is my big H's from that parent. So every single one of them ends up the same genotype, big H, little h. But the question is not asking us about their genotype, OK? It's asking us about their phenotype. So how do they physically look? So if every single one of these has a big H in them, that tells us that it's going to be the dominant form. And the dominant form was wavy hair. OK, so it's really important in questions like this that you read specifically what they're looking for, because it would be easy to get caught out. But you need to work out what their phenotype is. OK, we're then told that one of the F1 mice is crossed with a straight haired mouse. So all of these were the same. So we know that the F1 mouse is going to be big H, little h. But it's going to be crossed with a straight haired mouse. Because straight hair is recessive, it says wavy hair is dominant to straight hair. So straight hair must be recessive. Then the only way that we can get a straight haired mouse is if it is little h, little h. So that's the cross. And we're asked to state the genotype of the wavy haired offspring. So first thing we need to do is we need to do that cross. So I'm going to draw my Punnett square and put in one of the parents down the side. I'm putting the other parent up top, and then I'm going to work my way down, first of all. And then I'm going to work my way across. And that is the genotypes of the offspring that we would get from this cross. 
but we're asked to state the genotype of the wavy-haired offspring. So the only wavy-haired ones are these ones. The other two would be straight hair. So the genotype has to be big H, little h. All right. Another question. In humans, the inheritance of earlobe type is an example of discrete variation. The allele for free earlobes is dominant to the allele for fixed earlobes. And the diagram below shows the inheritance of this characteristic. We're asked which line of the table correctly identifies the genotypes of individuals R and S. So if free earlobes is dominant, then we can make a safe assumption about the genotypes of the fixed earlobe ones. The only way that you could have fixed earlobes because it's recessive is if you are little e, little e. So all the individuals that have got white square are going to be little e, little e. Now we're only interested in the genotypes of R and S, but that's us straight away figured out what S must be. So having a look in your multiple choice answers, we need to look at the ones that have S as being little e, little e. So it's going to have to be A or B because these ones are wrong. So we can just straight away get rid of C and, and D. Done. But we now need to work out what the genotype of R is, which is a wee bit more complicated because it's dominant. So the two possible genotypes for this are big E, big E, or big E, little e. So we can answer this one because if we have a look at this individual, we'd already worked out that they have to have a little e and a little e. We know that one of the little e's came from that parent. The other little e has to have come from this parent. So individual R has to have a little e to pass on to his child. But because he has the free year lobes, which is dominant, then he must also have a big e. So that tells us that it's got to be this one. So there we go. Just a few more to go. So have a look at this one. 10 and 11 refer to the diagram below of a human family tree showing the inheritance of tongue rolling. The allele for tongue rolling is dominant to the allele for non-rolling, little t. Now, we've done quite a few worked examples together. So what might make sense is have a look at the two questions, pause the video, try these ones yourself, and then when you're ready, Unpause and I'll talk you through it and see if you are correct. Okay, so the allele for tongue rolling is dominant to the allele for non rolling. So that's worth highlighting that, that keeps us right. Which of the following individuals in the family tree are homozygous? Okay, so we know that the non rolling ones have to be homozygous. Because it's recessive, they have to have little t, little t. So that makes things a little bit easier for us because we can fill these in. Okay. We have been told the genotypes of the two parents. That helps matters as well. Um, so the roller is dominant. So we know that this individual has passed on a big t to both of these. And we know that this individual has to have passed on a little t to both of these, okay? Because remember, all of these individuals have come from across from these two parents, okay? So the ones that are homozygous in this are individuals Q and R, because they are both little t, little t. We don't have a big t, big t, so that is it. So the answer to that question is D. The next question, the chance of individual Q and a non-roller male partner producing a child who is a non-roller. So we have to do a cross here. So individual Q, this one here, we know that they are little t, little t. Okay, we've already worked that one out. And a non-roller male. So if they are a non-roller, then they are little t, little t, because 
it's recessive. So every single individual is going to be little t. So the chance of them producing a child who is a non-roller is 100% or one in one, 100% chance. Okay, next up, and this is the last set of questions. So again, have a read of it yourself, give it a go, pause the video, give it a go, and then when you're ready, unpause and see how it's done. So an experiment was carried out to investigate stem height in pea plants. The parental phenotypes were tall and dwarf, as shown in the diagram. It says that the parent plants were both homozygous. They were crossed. When they were crossed, the F1 generation were all tall. So if both individuals are homozygous and they're bred together and all of them are tall, that's telling us that tall must be dominant. So we can consider that as being big T, big T, and the dwarf then, because it's recessive, must be little t, little t. These plants were then crossed with each other to produce the F2 generation. So if we work our way through that again, the parent plants were both homozygous and they were crossed. The F1 generation were all tall. So the parents were big T, big T, and little t, little t. The F1 generation are all going to be big T, little t. You can do the cross if you like from the parents to get that, but they're all going to be big T, little t. And then it says that these plants were then crossed with each other to produce the F2 generation. So that means that we've got two of the F1s crossed with each other to produce the F2 generation. So big T, little t's crossed with each other, and this is what we would get. Okay, so if we go to A1, the expected ratio in the F2 generation was three tall to one dwarf, which is what we've got here, three tall and then one dwarf. Calculate the expected number of tall plants if there were 144 plants produced in this generation. Okay, so we're told that it's three to one. So we need to think of that in terms of percentage. So 75% of them, three quarters, are tall. And that would be 25% of them as dwarf. So in other words, this is asking us what is 75% of 144? So to do that, 75 divided by 100 equals 0 0.75, and then we do 0 0.75 times 144, and that is going to equal, bear with me, I should have had my calculator ready, is going to equal 108. there were 108 tall plants expected in that generation based on that three to one ratio. Okay, the next part, the results obtained in the F2 generation differed from the expected results. The actual results were 90 tall and 36 dwarf plants. So we're to calculate the simplest whole number ratio for these results. So if we start off with what we have got, okay, so we've got 90 to 36. And it's just a ratio question. The first thing that I would do is see if the biggest number can divide by the smallest number to give us a whole number. But if we do 90 divided by 36, we do not get a whole number, we get 2.5. So instead, what we need to do is we need to find a common number that both of them will divide by. And the easiest way to approach that is you need to just sort of be thinking of times tables, okay? 90 and 36 are both in the nine times table. So that's how I would start. So I'm gonna divide both sides by nine, okay? So when we do that, we are going to get 90 divided by nine equals 10. 36 divided by nine is gonna equal four. 
Okay, that's the first step. Now I'm going to have another look at that. I've now got it to 10 to 4. Can those both divide by anything to get it even smaller? The answer is yes, they can. Both 10 and 4 are in the 2 times table, so we can divide by 2. And that is going to give us our answer, which is 10 divided by 2 equals 5. 4 divided by 2 equals 2. So the answer to that question is 5 to 2. Okay, it's a simplified ratio. And that is it. So the best way for you to deal with exam style questions in this key area, obviously there are some knowledge questions. That's again, it's down to revision. You need to know what the terms mean in this topic. But the problem solving aspect of this topic is quite big and it's quite unique. You need to be able to do genetic crosses, as I've shown you here, and you also need to be able to work with ratios, percentages. There's a bit of numeracy involved in this. But the more you practice these, the easier you will find it. So gain access to the past papers by topic, which should be on your class team, and try as many as you can get your hands on, and that will make this a much easier topic.